You are now tuned in to the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there even when the success you've expected to achieve is yet to occur. And on top of all this, we're not done. You need a huge dose of personal initiative. That is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, mindset, strategies, techniques, and mentalities all underneath the umbrella of one unifying philosophy that is called, we can all say it together, it is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is how to have the belief that it can be done. Now, what is it? Well, you fill in the blank of what that it is. If you feel like you are going against the odds right now, you feel like you're going against the grain, you feel like not too many people are believing in your idea or your ability or your potential or your future success, how can you establish in your own mind the belief that that thing can actually be achieved despite maybe you know, a whole lot of people or whatever is a whole lot in your world considering that it's not possible? Now, before I get into where this is coming from and us getting into the topic, let me tell you, I send a daily motivation text out every day. This is something that'll help you believe. You want to get that message that'll keep you focused, sharp, and on point every single day, guaranteed, straight to your phone, free of charge. All you got to do is text me at my number. It's the same number that I'll be sending my motivation text from. The number is 305-384-6894. Once you text me there, you'll be confirmed, and every day you'll get that daily motivation text straight to your phone, again, free of charge. So that number is also down below in the show notes, just in case you didn't catch it. So this topic, I thought of this topic because I just finished reading, well, from when I I decided to do this this episode. I've read a couple books since this, but I read this book called Conspiracy by Ryan Holiday. And this is a really good book. And this book was a, it's kind of a, a narrative book. It's just telling the story of this whole situation that happened with uh, this guy named Peter Thiel, who is a entrepreneur and investor. He's one of the people who started PayPal. He might've been the guy who started PayPal. And he had a bone to pick with this company called Gawker. Now, Gawker was a uh, blogging type of gossip type of website where they would just post random uh, pop culture, not even yeah, pop culture, things about known entities, people like Peter and other people, and sometimes outing people with news that they probably wouldn't want the whole world to know or just you know, sharing their opinions on things. It's kind of like a gossip blog, but they were a big deal around the probably in the early to the first decade of this century, this company, Gawker, and going into the second decade. They also had a sports theme website under their umbrella, their whole big company called Deadspin. And I actually liked Deadspin in its in its heyday when it was out. It was very it was a very snarky type of website. That's the kind of site it was. Real real snarky stuff. And sometimes it would be funny and sometimes I say, all right, they didn't have to do all that. But I enjoyed their angle. I enjoyed their um, their presence in the world. But anyway this company, Gawker, had outed this guy, Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel is homosexual, and it was known amongst his circle, people who are around him and knew him personally knew he was homosexual, but the world didn't know, and Gawker outed him for being homosexual. And that is not a crime, but they did it, and Peter Thiel did not like that. Now, Peter Thiel is a billionaire, and he was pissed off at this company, and he wanted to get back at them, but it wasn't really much that he could do legally to get back at them for what they did, because again, it's not illegal to put put it out there that someone is homosexual, even though he didn't want them to. It's not illegal. So he had to. He was you know, kind of pissed off at them, but he kept running his businesses, doing his thing. He bided his time and waited for an opportunity. And what happened a few years later is Gawker published some clips from a video of a guy by the name of Hulk Hogan. And I think all of you know. Many of you probably know who Hulk Hogan is. Probably the most famous wrestler of all time. Hulk Hogan. Had, had a whole lot of stuff going on in his personal life. I'm not going to go into all the details. You can, if you know about this story, you might know a little bit about it. Or if you read the book Conspiracy, you'll get all the details. Hulk Hogan got invited over to his best friend's house. His best friend is a man. And his best friend is married to a woman. Now, he goes to his best friend's house. His best friend proposes to Hulk Hogan that I want you to have sex with my wife in front of me and I'm going to watch. Now, Hulk Hogan was not really, he didn't really, he wasn't really into it initially, but somehow, some way, he ends up in, this might have been under the uh, influence of some alcohol and maybe some drugs. You can read the book again, find out for yourself. He ends up doing it. He ends up having sex with his best friend's wife 
in front of his best friend. And his best friend, unbeknownst to Hulk Hogan, allegedly, and this is how it ends up coming out in court, he filmed the whole thing. So this video ends up getting out. Hulk Hogan did not intend for this video to get out. He didn't even know he was being filmed. He did not consent to being filmed doing these things. So he has sex with his best friend's wife, is on film. The video ends up getting out. Again, read the book. You'll find out how the video got out. Gawker, this website, they're the type of website, they're, they're like a tabloid type of website. They would pay somebody money for this kind of scoop. They go and they publish this. Hulk Hogan gets pissed off and this ends up going to court. Long story short. And this is a long, drawn out court battle that costs a whole lot of money. Peter Thiel, remember him from earlier in my anecdote here, he was pissed off at Gawker for outing him years earlier, but he couldn't do anything legal about that. But when he saw the Hulk Hogan situation, through other people, so he had all these people kind of working as liaisons for him, Peter Thiel, because he's the guy with all the money. Hulk Hogan had money, but he didn't have that much money. He connects with Hulk Hogan, not directly, but through other people, and says, look, I will finance you taking Gawker to court so that we can take that company out. Because again, Peter Thiel didn't really care about Hulk Hogan. He cared about taking down Gawker, and he could use Hulk Hogan as his, kind of his proxy to do what he actually wanted to do back then, but he couldn't do anything legally. Now he had a chance to do something legally. Long story short, he finances this whole thing. Hulk Hogan goes to court against Gawker, and they ended up they end up winning. And they win this huge settlement against Gawker, ends up putting Gawker out of business because they didn't have enough money to pay the lawsuit that they ended up losing. So this is the long story of what, or the short story of the long story that's in the book, Conspiracy. And this is a, a really good book. Ryan Holiday did a great job on this book. And he's written, uh, Ryan Holiday's written several books and not all of them are this type. Some of them are more the personal development side. He writes a lot about uh, stoicism and mindset and things like that. But this is one of his best, uh, this book here. So I would suggest you go check it out. So in conclusion of this anecdote here, I haven't even gotten into the points of today's topic. But when I was reading this book, one of the things that sparked the idea for this masterclass was Peter Thiel had this belief and he held on to this belief for like a decade that he could find a way to take this company down. And it was his belief that he could take this company down, not just the money that he had. Yes, he needed money to execute on his strategy, but it was his belief that he could actually do it that became the main driver of this, end, this ending up being what it ended up being. Because if he had the money, but not the belief, then this story would not have become a book because it wouldn't have happened. And it made me think about that and it led to this today. How can you have that belief in mind, especially when you're executing on something that takes a long time to draw out and play its way out like this did when you're talking about court cases and any of you who's ever been involved, been involved in any type of court case or any type of lawsuit, you know that these things can drag on forever and there's you no know, things get pushed back and then there's future dates and you gotta keep paying the lawyers and this can completely drain somebody's resources going back and forth to court, which is why a lot of situations that start off as legal situations end up getting settled out of court simply because people don't want to keep you know, paying those lawyers or can't afford to keep paying lawyers to keep going back and forth. But Peter Till, he had the resources to do so, but he also had the mentality to do so. And that's really what I wanna talk about here today. So I'm not gonna tell you how to, how, to, how to have enough money to keep paying lawyers, but I will tell you how to have the mentality to believe something can be done in or outside of court, probably mostly outside of court in all of life. Point number one, topic once again, it's how to believe that it can be done. Number one, be willing to try what most people are not willing to go after. This is your first point. Now this point comes with a disclaimer or two. One of the disclaimers is, because the point is be willing to try what most people aren't willing to try. Sometimes in life, actually many times in life, no one is willing to try something or maybe people have been willing to try, but you don't know about it. And no one is trying to do a certain thing simply because there's not a lot of opportunity there. So this is where your skill of discernment comes in. This is where you have to make judgment calls. I talked on the skill of discernment in episode 1431, your skill of perception and judgment. What I mean here is this. If you look at opportunity, let's say you see an opportunity in doing X, Y, Z. Okay. And you're looking at it and you say, damn, 
This is a wide open opportunity, X, Y, Z. If I do this and this and this with this opportunity, I can make this much money, I can get this success, I can do all these great things. And then you look around and you notice nobody else is trying to do it. So you're like, damn, this is a wide open lane with plenty of opportunity. I can make all this money, get all this success. And nobody else is doing it. This is perfect. And you wanna drop everything else you got going on and go try opportunity X, Y, Z because you see that it's wide open for you. Here's my word of caution to you. There are 8 billion people on the planet. If you see an opportunity or what looks like an opportunity to you and you notice that no one else is trying to do it, there may be a good reason that nobody else is trying to do it. The good reason might be because there isn't as much opportunity there as you think you see. And again, what I'm deferring to here, what I'm pointing to here is the reason why I believe that is because, well, first of all, I have, I have seen it in my own life. Second of, all, second of all, because there are a lot of marketing and sales experts out there who have said this exact thing. And third, because if there are 8 billion people on the planet and you think you are the first one to see this opportunity, the first one to go take advantage of it, that means you are smarter than the other 8 billion people on the planet collectively. Now, you might be smarter than each one individually, but collectively, you're smarter than the whole rest of the world? Probably not. I'm going to just offer you a dose of, I'm just ask you to have a dose of humility here. Sometimes in life, Nobody else is going after an opportunity simply because there is no opportunity there. Now, other times, this is where the discernment comes in. Nobody else is going after an opportunity simply because nobody wants to put the time in. Nobody wants to put the effort in. Nobody believes that there's something there. Nobody is willing to be as diligent and as persistent and as mentally tough as you might be willing to be. So again, this is where the judgment comes in because it could be either one. You could prove the rest of the world wrong and shock the world and, and achieve something that nobody else thought was possible. That is absolutely possible that it could happen. But it's also possible that you're going to go after it and you're going to find out the same thing that the last 25 people who had the same idea as you did. You just didn't know about them because nobody talks about them because they didn't succeed. All right, we, don't make, we don't make books about people who lose that there isn't really no opportunity there. But you had to put all that time, effort, energy, money and attention into it trying to figure that out when maybe you should have just thought of that from the beginning. This is where your skill of judgment comes in. However, we're still on point one here. When you are willing to try what most other people are not willing to try, you eliminate competition and you give yourself a chance at success. This does not guarantee success, far from it, but you give yourself a chance at success. This is moonshot thinking. You could take a look at a guy, if you go, go on YouTube, and you look up a guy by the name of Astro Teller. Astro Teller, you spell his name how it sounds. He talks on this concept of moonshot thinking. He has this patented speech that I've heard him give. Well, I heard him give it one time, I was listening to the Tim Ferriss podcast, and Tim took this clip from the speech that Astro Teller was talking about this concept of moonshot thinking. And it's only about 10 minutes maybe, maybe even less than that. And, at, and then I looked up Astro on YouTube because I'd never heard of him before that. And he's given the same, he gives the same speech everywhere he goes. And it's a really good idea. He talks about moonshot thinking and the, the simple way of explaining it is most people don't think they can hit the moon with one shot. And the few people who do try, most of the time they fail, but the few times that they succeed, the reward for succeeding at trying something that most people aren't even willing to try, the rewards are so outsized that it's worth it to at least give it a shot. That's the, the simple concept of moonshot thinking, but again, I would suggest you look up this guy, Astro Teller, let him explain it in his own words, because it's his idea, so he could explain it better than me. It's also a guy by the name of Sam Hinkey. Many of you might not know who he is, but if you're a sports fan, you might. Sam Hinkey was the chief decision maker when it came to personnel from my hometown, Philadelphia 76ers, for several years, while they were in what we all now finally refer to as the process. And what the process was, was the Philadelphia 76ers, just to give you an idea of how the, the NBA system works and sports systems work in general. Every year there's a draft. I think many of you know about the draft. The draft is the professional sports team's opportunity to select up and coming talent out of the amateur ranks to become pro athletes. So the NFL has a draft, baseball, hockey, basketball, they all have a draft, right? Where all the, the best, bright, brightest young players get picked to join new teams. And the way the draft system is set up is it goes in the opposite direction of success. So the worst team in the league, the worst teams rather, usually get first dibs on a new talent because that whole concept, the general idea, the theory, is that we give the worst teams the opportunity to pick the best new players coming in so that we can maintain some balance in the league. 
Because you don't want to take the team that just won the championship and then give them the best new player because then it will just become so lopsided that the, the best teams just keep getting better and the worst teams keep getting worse. There won't be any balance. So the whole idea in theory of the draft is to give the worst teams the opportunity to pick the best new players coming in. So, for example, somebody like LeBron James, when he got drafted, he got picked by the Cleveland Cavaliers. And the reason why the Cavs were positioned to pick him is because the Cavaliers have been a very bad team prior to LeBron becoming available. So they were one of the worst teams. They got to pick the best players. They chose a guy like LeBron James. And you think of all the great players that you've heard of in sports. Many of them got drafted to teams that were terrible prior to that player showing up. And in theory, it worked out because that young player became this great superstar and elevated the level of the team along with their teammates. That's the theory of the draft. I'm pointing all this out to explain this. Sam Hinkie, as the person who was the chief decision maker for the Philadelphia 76ers, he came up with this theory that we're going to exploit the system. And his idea was this. We're going to have a really bad team for several years in a row. And each year, because we're so bad, we get first dibs on a new young talent coming into the league. So what we're gonna do for several years, we're gonna stockpile this great young talent on one team, then eventually that all that young talent we have amassed will coalesce into this great team that is then able to compete and win. So in other words, the Sixers were in a kind of a, a wink, wink type of way. They didn't say this explicitly because they probably would have faced a stiff penalty from the NBA for doing so. But they were, it was clear that the Sixers were planning to not really be competitive. They didn't really want to win a lot of games. Yeah, they put a team out there and they played every game. But their idea was, let's be bad for several years. We get to pick the best players every year. Then after four or five years of this, we'll have a whole bunch of really good players. And those players will be ready to mature and become really good. And the team will be competitive. Now, the Sixers are a pretty good team now as of this recording. And they have a few pieces to show from this whole system that they ran, and it was called The Process. And I detailed this whole thing in episode 616, 616, which is listed down below. The title is Respect and Trust the Process. And Sam Hinkie, in his when he ended up resigning from the Philadelphia 76ers, he wrote this in his letter. And I would suggest you all look up this letter because he is really, Sam Hinkie's really a business guy who happened to be working in the basketball world. He's not a basketball guy who was hired to do a job. He's a business guy who was hired to work in basketball. And the theory that he talks about in his resignation letter was that you need to be willing to go against the grain, but you also need to be right. Because if you go against the grain and you're wrong, what happens? Well, you look like an idiot, nobody remembers you, and you lose your job, you get fired, you make no money. But if you go against the grain and you win, you become a hero, you stand off from everybody else, your ROI is outsized compared to everybody else's ROI because you weren't going with the grain and did what everyone expected you to do. You went against the grain, proved yourself correct, and your returns are a thousand times what everybody else's returns are simply because you did what nobody thought you were capable of doing. But understand, so that, those wins are huge, but most of the fails, the fails are much more numerous, but the times that somebody wins, those are the ones that everybody talks about. So this is the exception proving the rule. That's exactly what Sam Hinkie was talking about. It's exactly what Astro Teller was talking about. Most people fail with moonshots, though, be clear, because moonshots are moonshots. That's why you fail. But many people fail with moonshots simply because they never try. Not because they're ignorant that they exist, because they don't think they are capable of achieving a win with a moonshot. So they never try in the first place. So any of you out there who feels like you have an idea that goes against the grain and the odds are against you, at least being willing to give it a shot positions you as eligible for getting those outside returns, but I wouldn't bet. I wouldn't bet my whole life on it. I'd take a small piece of what you have and bet on it, understanding that you're probably going to lose that bet. But if you win, the ROI is amazing. All right, everybody clear on that? Point number two. Today's topic, once again, is how to believe that it can be done. Number two, keep fighting when most other people quit. This is a simple concept. Uh, persistence, grit, perseverance, mental toughness. Uh, we have different words for this, all meaning the same thing. When things are not working in your favor, as I explained in, in the intro of this show, the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. Just keep going when most logical, reasonable people will stop going. Showing up is half the battle in life. And most importantly, showing up when you get to the third day. That's the most important thing in life. I was just, somebody was just texting me today. If you haven't texted me, by the way, my number is down below so you can get my daily motivation text. But also when you text me, you are texting me directly. So I do respond to my text and you will be talking directly to me. 
uh, somebody was texting me today and they said one of their biggest challenges is you know finding that that grit and that toughness to really show up and work hard on the days when they don't really feel like working hard and that I asked that person have you read my book the third day because that's exactly what it's about and they said yeah I plan on reading it I have it on the way and all of that showing up on the third day this is one of the biggest skills that allow you make you eligible to believe that it can be done it being whatever outcome you're going after Paul Graham who is the one of the uh, founders of this company called Y Combinator which is a is a uh, what's the word no, what's the word I'm looking for ah, the word is escaping me I can't even think of it but it's a place that helps entrepreneurs who have business ideas really get their ideas um, Damn, the word is escaping me. I can't think of it, but helps get their ideas off the ground, helps poke holes in their ideas, helps them work on themselves as entrepreneurs, and just helps. Damn, I'm, I keep trying to think of this word and is is on the tip of my tongue, but I can't think of I can't think of the exact word. But anyway, Paul Graham, he's written a whole bunch of essays online. If you look him up again, look, search his name as it sounds, Paul Graham, and just look up Paul Graham essays, and they're basically blog posts where he is just writing about principles of business, principles of success, principles of you know, just making it happen in life. And what I call the third day, Paul Graham calls the trough of sorrow. It's the exact same thing. And what, how he explains it in short is that as an entrepreneur, let's say you start a business, right? And you want to go get some funding for your business. So you go out and you pitch your business, let's say like a show like Shark Tank, or you go to somewhere like Y Combinator and someone decides to invest in your business. They give you a million dollars to invest in your business. So now you are the head of a company that is valued at a million dollars or a million times, whatever the percentage is. And now you're the head of this company and now everybody knows your name. There are articles written about you, press releases come out about you. You're, the, you're that guy or that girl because you have this company that's worth whatever millions of dollars. And you feel good at the beginning, you got this money, and you build your team and you get started. You're putting your stuff out there and you get some initial feedback that is positive. Some customers are liking your stuff, people like your idea, you're this, this golden boy or golden girl of the business world because everybody knows that you're this new startup that's out there, you're the new hotshot on the market. And that goes for a little while, but eventually you get to the third day. Eventually you get to the point where that excitement kind of wears off, the novelty of the situation is gone, and you realize that there's some real work that needs to be done and all that initial momentum that you had, it doesn't just keep going, it doesn't just go forever. I don't know if there's anyone who's listening to this or watching me right now who anything you ever tried, it was just complete straight up and to the right, as they say. Everything was just working, everything you tried succeeded, every product you put out, everybody bought it, every idea you said, everybody just immediately adopted it and everything was just working perfectly and you never had any challenges. Any of you ever had that experience? I haven't. So Paul Graham, what I call the third day, he calls the trough of sorrow. That's what happens with entrepreneurs when they get that initial burst when they start off. And then eventually they get to the point like, OK, this is not going to be as easy as it looks. The real test of a belief or an expectation is in the accompanying action. I'll repeat the real test of a belief or an expectation is in the accompanying action that supports that belief or expectation. Not just the words that you believe something or that you expect something, but you actually doing something. Many of the things that I did that became my resume in sports, business, everything, were simply me continuing to show up even when those things were not working. Because nothing that I've achieved that you can you know, Google about me was something that just worked the first time that I tried it. Nothing I did worked the very first time that I tried it. I had to keep, I had to keep working on it and make it better as it went. Actually, there are some things that worked from the beginning, but I still had to get better at them. Like to this day, if I'm still doing it, I had to get better at them. So for example, this very show that you're listening to, when I first started, people liked it, but I've gotten better over time. You listen to some of my earlier episodes, you listen to this one, where you know, over 2,000 days straight into this, I'm a lot better now than I was, let's say, even 1,000 days ago. So I got better at it over time. It's not like I just started it and it was just set it, forget it. You never had to improve. It's always, it's always that continuing improvement that must go on. Very rare is the person who just touches something and it works just like that and they never had to make any improvements or adjustments. That's very rare. Understand that anything that you start in life, everybody's going to be excited at the beginning. Then that novelty wears off. Then you get to the third day, and what the third day does is it disposes of a whole lot of people. The third day is not just something that everyone, they filter through it, like you, everyone goes through the third day filter and comes out stronger on the other end. No, the third day filters some people out to where they're completely out of the game and you don't ever hear from them again. 
trust me, everything that I've achieved, I've seen some people who started at the same time as me, but when I got to the end, I don't know what happened to them. I haven't seen them since. And understand, you add another third day and another third day, just in case the last one didn't do the job. By the time you get to the end, you've been through so many third days that everybody who was at you at the starting point will not be there at the end point. So if you keep showing up, you might win. But if you don't show up, if you don't keep showing up, you can't win. There's a good chance, though, even if you keep showing up, you go through all the third days, you might still lose anyway. Now, this is something that your favorite motivator won't tell you. But I will. So now that you know this, if you're still in, let's keep going. Point number three. Today's topic, once again, is how to believe that it can be done. And you fill in what the it is. Number three. Remember that most people will support and rally behind a person who is willing to stick their neck out. But very few people are willing to be the one out in front sticking their neck out. Let me say that one more time. I'm going to make sure you understand what I'm saying here. It's a long sentence. Most people will support and rally behind you when you are willing to stick your neck out and go against the grain and try to uh, go against all odds and shock the world. People will support you when you announce that you're going to try it. Okay. While at the same time, those same people who are supporting you when you stick your neck out and put your life and your ass on the line to go against the grain and succeed, none of them is willing to do it. They will support you doing it, but they're not going to do it. So I want you to keep that in mind. People will cheer for you to do something that they would never do themselves. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm not even saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it's a thing. So this is something that you should keep in mind when you know, people are encouraging you to try something that is risky and you're risking your time, attention, energy, if nothing else, but they're not willing to do it. So that's to, that's to tell you something. You decide what that something is. So my question is, do you want to be the leader or you want to be the follower? A disclaimer is, it's much safer and much less risky to be the follower than it is to be the leader. But the payoff of being a leader is a thousand times more when it succeeds. Understanding that you're not going to succeed every time. But since you do get to choose between being a leader and a follower, you should decide because time is ticking on you every day. Are you willing to stand on the front line and take the blame for the failure and take it on the chin if and when that thing you're trying doesn't work? Especially if it's a moonshot, most of the time it won't. But also, are you willing to collect if and when you do win? Because when you win, again, that payoff is way bigger compared to the risk that you had to put up in the first place. But all of this coming with the disclaimer that you only have but so much time in life. Right? You can't just keep doing this and keep losing. Eventually, you're going to run out of time. So this is where discernment comes in. You got to make choices. Let's recap today's class, which is how to believe that it can be done. Read the book Conspiracy by Ryan Holiday. Really good book. Even if you don't know anything about the story that he's talking about, you'll know it all by the time you finish the book. I didn't know much about it. So I read it. I heard of it, but I didn't know anything about it. But I read the book and then I learned all about it. And it was really more about, again, the principles that I got from reading it. It's not so much about the actual details of the story because stories like that come and go. It's the principles that matter the most. Point number one. Be willing to try, but most people are not willing to go after it. This eliminates competition and it gives you a chance. It's a moonshot idea, which don't always work, but when they do, the payoff is more than worth it. Number two, keep fighting when most other people quit. Showing up is half the battle in life. This is getting through the third day. Paul Graham calls it the trough of sorrow. Is the exact same thing. Every third day you go through filters more people out. Getting through all the third days gives you a chance to win. It still does not guarantee it. Number three. Remember that most people will support and rally behind you when you're sticking your neck out, but they will not stick their neck out the same way they're supporting you doing it. So do you want to be the leader or the follower? It is much safer and much less risky to be the follower, but the payoff of being a leader is a thousand times more. So you got to decide because time is ticking on you every day. Are you willing to stand on the front line and take the blame for failure? And also, are you willing to collect if and when you succeed with the caveat that most of the time you won't? All this said, text me, get my daily motivation text free to your phone every day. My number is 305-384-6894. If you want to be coached by me, you want to get on a live training call with me every week, you want to connect with the group of professionals that I have brought together to help exchange ideas, to trade skills, to trade connections, to trade networks so that you can build your business and your career faster, then I would suggest you join my Bulletproof Mastermind. It's the only place that this happens. The link to that is down below at workonyourgameuniversity.com. Work on your game. Dre all day.